Please open your Bibles with me to 1 John as we continue our study through this book. We're in chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. Some of you may have seen this on the news. I'll read it from an article off the internet. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot has questioned Texas Governor Greg Abbott's Christian faith after the Lone Star State bused asylum seekers to her city to mitigate the influx of immigrants crossing its borders. She said, He professes to be a Christian. This is not the Christianity and the teachings of the Bible that I know. I'm realizing the context is rather humorous, but on a more serious note, recently I was conversing with a Christian man, and he was relating to me his experience in a local church that he had been a part of for some time. And he told me that he looked around one Sunday morning, he looked around and he was observing the people that were there, and the question came to his mind, how many of these people are truly born-again Christians? And he said the reason he asked that question to himself was that he, he just considered their, their lack of interest in, in spiritual things and the things of Christ. You know, it, it's very easy to question whether or not someone is a genuine Christian. And I think the reason it's easy is, is because professing Christians often give us cause to, to doubt the sincerity of their faith. But we all know, or we should know, that going through life questioning other people's salvation is not primarily what we're called to do. Um, the, the, the Scriptures give many admonitions for us to examine our own lives. But there, is there ever a time when, when we should question the Christianity of another professing Christian? Or, or is there a time when we should question whether our own profession of faith in Christ is genuine. In his first letter, John indicates that there are reasons to ask this question. And there are answers. And today in our text, we see one of those answers as John continues to speak to this moral test of genuine Christianity. John's message is one that was necessary in the first century because of the prevalent false teaching of the early Gnostics and probably other heretics as well. Because they said that how one lived his life out or how one lived her life out in the moral sense really had nothing to do with whether or not that person was a child of God. In some of those Gnostic heretics, they supposed that their acquisition of, of divine knowledge had made them perfect. And they didn't need to be concerned with, with how they lived. And others maintained that sin just didn't matter because it, it could not harm them because of their enlightenment that they had received, this, this special knowledge that they had. But both positions were morally perverse. The first is blind to sin and denies its existence. And the second is indifferent to sin and denies its seriousness. And these false teachings have continued for the two millennia that the church has existed. And, and we all know it still needs to be addressed today. And so John's teaching here in 1 John chapter 3 speaks to our day as well. So let's read the text we'll be looking at in verses 4 through 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. 
Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Father, we pray that Your Word would find lodging in our hearts this morning that we would be able to grasp the truth of it. Give us faith to believe it. Lord, help us to apply it to our own lives and to others that You would have us to help in their walk in this life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Last week we looked at chapter 2, verse 28, through chapter 3 and verse 3. And, and there John argued that we should seek to live righteous lives, holy lives, in light of Jesus' second coming. And as he continues with this moral test, he now links living a righteous life with Christ's first coming. And he argues for the necessity of holy living not this time on the expectation of the Lord's second coming, but from the purpose of His first coming, which, we, as we just read, was to remove sin, to take away sin, and to destroy the works of the devil. And so what we see right away here in this passage is that habitual sin in the life of a genuine believer is incompatible with Christ's first appearance. It's incompatible. We see this in verses 4 through 7. And John says right off here, the nature of sin is lawlessness. It's lawlessness. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And really, you think about it, lawlessness is the clearest explanation of what sin is. Lawlessness is a defiant violation of God's moral law a defiant violation of God's moral law you know sin is defined and explained in, in various ways in the New Testament um, you probably familiar with these verses Romans 14 23 whatever does not proceed from faith is sin if you go against your conscience um, you're sinning is the idea there James 4, 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So it's not only a matter of doing what's wrong, it's a matter of not doing what's right, James says. And, and then John will later say here in this letter that all wrongdoing is sin. And we could talk about sin and we, uh, for a long time. We've, we covered it in some detail when we went through the first chapters of Genesis there. But the primary Greek word used for sin is, again, you probably know, is it means to miss the mark. Uh, meaning to miss the mark of God's righteous standard. God is the standard. And, and we all fall short of that, Romans 3.23. None of us, none of us um, can, can meet God's standard. And we understand also that His righteous standard is revealed in His law. The law is the expression of, of, the, of the character of God. And His law is summed up, how? In the two greatest commandments. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, on these two hang all the law and the commandments. So sin is lawlessness. Sin is not simply disregard for God's law, but in its very nature, sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is the essence, not the result of sin. Somebody isn't lawless because they sinned. No, the, the, the lawlessness is the sin. 
And John really exposes the the ugly reality, the the seriousness of sin, which we know in our culture is, is, is avoided. People don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about the ugly reality of what sin is. Well, as we mentioned, the heretics of John's day, they taught that to be enlightened, um, they didn't need to worry about morality. It was, they were just indifferent to it. Um, they didn't need to be concerned about the moral, moral or ethical issues. But again, the, the same heresy is taught in our day by many who claim the name of Christ. And, and you know this as you talk to people, or, or perhaps, you, perhaps you do this yourself. People excuse lawlessness and they blame their sin or the sin of others on various things. Personality problems. Well, that's just the way I am. Some people blame it on God, right? That's the way God made me. They blame it on on personality problems. They they blame it on one's upbringing. Well, he, he... that's the way he was brought up. They, they, blame, they blame it on some type of cultural relativity. And I'll tread lightly here, but, but sometimes it's blamed on mental illness. Obviously, I believe there is such a thing as mental illness, but, but I think it's used often to just cover up sin. To not really say, okay, this, this is really a sin issue here. You know, we can't deny that, that there are factors involved in, in why people sin. But sin is lawlessness. Sin is active rebellion against God's known will. That's what sin is. And it's important to acknowledge the nature of sin because the first step toward holy living, the, the, the first step toward, toward living a righteous life is to recognize the true nature of and the wickedness of sin. It is rebellion against God. It is living in opposition to His revealed will. John tells us in verse 5 that the purpose of Christ's coming was to take away sin. And John refers his readers to, to knowledge that they already had concerning Christ's person and His work. The truths of Christ's work of taking away sin and His per- per- personal sinlessness, these two truths are brought together here. He's the sinless one who came to take away sins. And, and of course, this is the, the whole gospel, right? And I'm just going to run through some verses very quickly that, that you know well. Um, John the Baptist said the same thing, right? The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says in 926, but as, but as it is, He, that's Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. In, in the New Testament, it explains in detail that, that Jesus takes away sin by taking the sins upon Himself, bearing them in His own body. And again, some very familiar verses to most of you. 1 Peter 2.24 He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. And in, in, in Jesus, in doing this, in removing our sins, He he, he himself was entirely without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness, righteousness of God. Hebrews 7.26, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. 1 Peter 2.22, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. And, and of course, there, there are other passages we, we understand these truths as, as believers in Christ. 
We understand that He is the sinless one. He is the perfect and holy one. The one that the demons cried out to. You're the holy one of God. And it's this perfect and sinless Jesus who came for the purpose of taking away sins. Of removing sins. And John draws a a logical, moral conclusion that somebody who claims to be Christ cannot live in habitual sin. It's incompatible with who Christ is and what He's done. It's inconceivable that someone who is abiding in Christ can habitually practice sin. John says no one who abides in Him keeps on sinning he, he goes on and he, and he says it's inconceivable that someone who habitually practices sin has ever seen christ or known him no one who keeps on sinning has either seen or known him he says john's very very straightforward here genuine believers have seen christ with the eye of faith and known Him by faith. But those who practice sin have never seen or known Him. If a person truly knows Christ, he will realize that sin and Christ are incompatible. That they're at enmity with one another. Christ in His sinless person and in His saving work is fundamentally opposed to sin. So it it is completely logical that one who sees and knows the righteous Christ practices righteousness. Look what he says here. He says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Verse 7, Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he, as Christ is righteous. Notice what he says here. Let no one deceive you. Don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you. If somebody is righteous, if somebody knows Jesus Christ, and they're one of His children, one of God's children, then He's practicing righteousness just as Christ is practicing righteousness. You know, in in present-day America, this is not a popular message. You know, I remember a few years ago preaching through Haggai in the Old Testament. And I remember thinking, man, this no wonder nobody preaches in Haggai. This is pretty rough stuff here. But John, I mean, John's just calling it straightforward here. I mean, he, he, it's not a popular message in our day, but, but there's no room for this easy believism stuff. There's no room for somebody to say, oh, I walked the aisle. I said a prayer. Now I can do whatever I want to do. Free from the law, happy condition, sin all I want, easy remission. No, that's not the gospel message. That's not what the Word of God says. This is the Word of God. We become really good at making excuses for people who call themselves Christians and habitually practice sin. We've really become good at it. And you may even make excuses for yourself. Now we need to understand something here, right? Before before someone goes off in the wrong direction. We must understand that there's a difference between a person who habitually practices lawlessness, that is a person who professes to know Christ and yet lives in a way that defiantly violates God's revealed will. There's a difference between a person like that and the person who struggles with sin. A believer who struggles with sin but but confesses it and seeks to get victory over his sin. You see the difference, right? You see what we're talking about here. There's a total difference between somebody who says, I'm a Christian... But he gives no regard for what God says. He does what he wants. He violates God's word. He he, he doesn't really care. And somebody who's over here and and he's got a problem with with some vice. Something he can't get victory over. He hasn't gotten victory over. He can. 
but he hasn't. There's a difference between these kinds of people. And we're talking about the one who practices lawlessness, who professes to be a Christian and says, well, I don't really care what the Bible says. I don't really care what, what, what the Scripture says. I believe on Jesus, but you know, I, don't, I don't need to worry about all this other stuff. So we need to understand that. So we need to examine our own lives in light of this. Um, if, if, if you're listening this morning and you, and you say, I'm a Christian, but you have no regard for the commandments of Christ, if you have no regard for God's law, so to speak, His Word, His revealed will, and you say, I can live however I want to live, th- then John says, you don't know the Lord. Because that's incompatible with who Jesus is and why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to save you so you could continue on in your sin. Jesus came to deliver you from your sin. Jesus came to put away sin. And we need to examine our own lives in this light. And we also need to warn people um, if they're living that way. If you, if you have a friend who says he's a Christian and has no regard for, for God's Word and for living in a way that pleases God, and I mean, I could put it in a hundred different ways, right? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, then, then, then you should warn them. You should take them to 1 John and show them this passage out of love and out of concern for them and for their eternal destiny. So John says that habitual sin in the life of a genuine Christian is incompatible with Christ's first coming. But he continues and he says that it's not only incompatible, but habitual sin in the life of a genuine believer is even impossible. It's impossible in light of Christ's first appearance. And we see this in verses 8 and 9. And he says that the origin of sin is the devil. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The characteristic work of the devil is to sin. Um, The characteristic work of the Son of God is to save. Uh, notice it says the works of the devil. There's been a lot of debate about what that means, but, but one thing we know it means, it, it's plural. It's the works of the devil. Because the devil's evil activities are many. And really, when it comes right down to it, his, his works include all of the evil that he has introduced into this perfect creation of God. One author points out, something I think is very helpful. He says the devil, um, the devil's work morally is enticement to sin. Physically, it's the infliction of disease. And intellectually, it's seduction into error. So, So he assaults soul, body, and mind. And you know, no one can rightly say, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make anyone do anything. And yet, sin has its origin in Satan. And of course, again, we can go back to Genesis 3 and, and, and see that. and we, we have studied that. But John tells us the purpose, of, the purpose of Christ's coming was to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. The word destroy here... Uh, literally means to loose. It doesn't mean to annihilate. But think about what, what Jesus did at the cross. At the cross, He rendered inoperative the power of the devil over those whom He saves. Um, it, it's as if the, the, these diabolical works were, were chains which were bound around us. Um, 
the writer of Hebrews alludes to this in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. This is, this is what the Lord did. People are bound in slavery to the devil. They're, they're taken captive to do His will, as the Scripture says. And, and Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He, he came to loose those chains. He came to deliver us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. God did this. So Jesus, in destroying the works of the devil, has not in this present age annihilated it. He hasn't annihilated the works of the devil, not yet. But rather, he, he's deprived the, devil of, the devil's work of, of its force. He's, he's rendered it inoperative. So the devil, though he's still doing his wicked works, he's been defeated. And, and those of us who are in Christ, we, we can't escape his his tyranny. We don't, we don't have to subject ourselves to the devil's temptations. No, in Christ, we, we have that victory. And, and again, John draws a logical moral conclusion here in verse 9. Look what he says. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Since the whole purpose... The whole purpose of Christ's first appearing was to remove sin and destroy the works of the devil. Christians must not compromise with either sin or the devil lest they find themselves fighting against Christ. When a person aligns himself with sin, he's aligning himself with the devil and he's aligning himself against Jesus Christ. It's impossible John says this, it's impossible for a person to know Christ as Savior and Lord and at the same time fight against Him on the side of His enemy, the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning or God's seed, for God's seed abides in Him and He cannot keep on sinning because He has been born of God. See, the result of being born again is that obviously what it, what it means is the person is regenerated. So John restates what he said in verse 6, the one who is abiding in Christ does not practice sin. The one who is abiding in Christ is the one who's been born of God. And, and the reference of God's seed abiding in him, that, that's been understood in various ways. Um, it could be a reference to the abiding word of God or specifically the gospel message, or, or it could possibly be the new birth itself, um, or it could be a reference to the Holy Spirit, which I would be inclined to think it is, uh, a reference to the Holy Spirit whom Jesus associates with the new birth in John chapter 3. But the primary truth that John is teaching is that a genuine believer has had a life changing transformation whereby he, he's no longer dead spiritually but rather he's alive in christ he he has a new birth and so john says not only does the one born of god not habitually practice sin but in fact he cannot habitually practice sin because he's been born of god and god's seed remains in him now again let's make sure we understand what John is saying here. He, he's not saying that it's impossible for a Christian to commit an act of sin. Um, if he was saying that, none of us would be saved, right? That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's saying it's impossible for someone who has been born of God to live a life of habitual sin. That's the logical conclusion that John draws here. If someone aligns himself with Jesus, who is sinless who came to this world to take away the sins and to destroy the works of the devil, then that person is not going to embrace sin as his or her lifestyle. 
John says it's impossible. It cannot be so. So, so we bring it down to, you know, real life here in America. Hi, I'm Pete. I'm a homosexual Christian. Oh, really? You're a homosexual Christian? No. You may be a homosexual, but, and you may call yourself a Christian, but according, according to what the Scripture says, you don't know God. You, you don't know God be, because homosexuality is sin. Right? You, that's not a popular message either, right? But, but it is. It's sin. I mean, you, you probably know the Scriptures. If you don't, I can give you a list of them. But, you know, it, it's sin. So for somebody to say, I practice homosexuality, but I know Jesus is my Savior, he's a liar. No. But it's, you know, that's, that's easy to pick out, right? Or, or you can, you know, here's a Christian, he hits the bars, he gets drunk, and he sleeps with a different woman every weekend. But he's a Christian. I'm a Christian. But this doesn't bother me. This is okay, you know. I mean, God doesn't really care. Jesus saved me. I can do this. No. No. He cannot do that if he knows the Lord. He cannot live that kind of lifestyle. He cannot, he cannot willfully violate the commandments of God and, and live that habitual lifestyle and be a true believer. Here, here's a Christian. A Christian, he makes his living stealing credit card information online and profiting financially from it. Oh, yeah, well, you know, hey, I've got the technology, and, you know, I, yeah, I'm a Christian. No. Or, or here's a Christian who constantly lies. And there's no guilt. No guilt in his conscience. He, he, he lies about everything, or she lies about everything that goes on, and just lie, 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 lie. And, and, and it's like, well, you know, nobody's perfect. But they, there's, no, there's no guilt in their conscience that, that they're, they're, they're lying. They're, they're not submitting to, to the God of all truth. They're not submitting to Him and seeking to get victory over lying. It's, they don't even care. See, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. God has called us to live holy lives. And the first thing we must do is to recognize the sinfulness of sin both in its essence as lawlessness and in its diabolical origin. And then we have to draw these logical, moral conclusions and understand that compromise with sin is absolutely incompatible with Christ and His sinless person and His saving work. And then the more clearly we grasp these truths, the more clearly we see the need to avoid sin in our own lives. In verse, second part of verse 9 and verse 10, we, we see that the absence or presence of habitual sin gives evidence of a person's relationship to God. You can add there. You see, verse 10 is both a summary of the previous paragraph and is a transition into what follows. John puts forth this truth in absolute black and white terms. He states there are two groups Children of God and children of the devil. Again, that's not a very popular message, right? Um, but, 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 but this is what John says. He says there's two groups. There are children of the devil, and they don't practice righteousness, and they don't love their brothers, speaking of other Christians. That's what the, who the children of the devil are. And, and then there's the children of God. In the end of verse 9 there, they cannot habitually practice sin because they've been born of God. And so here, here you have this contrast. You have this contrast between truth and falsehood, good and evil, right and wrong, God and the devil. And these are all irreconcilable opposites. They don't mesh. You can't mix them together. God is not the Father of all people. The universal fatherhood of God is not taught in the Bible. Not all people are God's children. 
And John is just repeating the truth that he, he heard from Jesus when Jesus was on earth, right? Some people who claim to be God's children are actually children of the devil. They're children of the devil. You, you remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8? He said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. As a genuine Christian, knowing who Christ is, the sinless one, and knowing why he came the first time to take away sins, makes habitual sin incompatible with true Christianity. Being born of God and, and having His Spirit dwelling within makes practicing sin impossible. Impossible. Again, not committing an act of sin, but making a practice of sin, living in habitual sin. It's not possible for someone who's been born of God and has God's seed dwelling within him the divine nature within the regenerate believer asserts itself against all evil it's impossible for him to make a practice of sin the believer may fall into sin but he will not walk in it he'll get up he'll repent he'll confess his sin one commentator sums up John's argument in chapter 2, verse 28, through chapter 3 and verse 10. I want to read this paragraph for you. He says, If Christ appeared first both to take away our sins and to destroy the devil's work, and if when he appears the second time, he will see him, and in consequence we shall be like him, how can we possibly go on living in sin? To do so would be to deny the purpose of both of his appearings. If we would be loyal to his first coming and ready for his second, we must purify ourselves as he is pure. By so doing, we shall give evidence of our birth of God. And that's, a, that's an excellent summary of, of, of these two paragraphs that we looked at last week and this week. Because it's only those who are born of, God's, of God that are God's children. <clears throat> And, and we know that those who are born of God are, are those who receive Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. I mean, John wrote in, in his gospel, again, familiar verses, said he came into his own and his own received him not. He says, but to all who did receive him, in John 1, 12 and 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, so John has laid out again this, this moral test to determine whether someone is a genuine believer. God's children and the devil's children can be recognized by their moral behavior. That's what John's saying here. The absence of righteous living proves the lack of a divine birth. John is, is, is going to move on to the social test. He's going to come back to that, this, this test of love in the next paragraph. And yet righteousness, as we'll see, uh, Lord willing, next week, righteousness and love, they're not entirely distinct from one another. Love is actually righteousness in relation to others. You know, there, a lot of the problem in, in our churches in America is, is, is with the people that stand up behind the pulpit. Those who are preachers and teachers 
and, and they're, they're unwilling to preach what the Word of God says. And so you've got churches that are filled with people who have just made a profession of faith. They've walked the aisle. They've said a prayer. And, and, and they're told, you're good. You've got your fire insurance. You're not going to hell, buddy. You're okay. Man, you just keep coming to church. And don't forget to put your tithe in the offering, though. But, you know, keep coming to church. I mean, that goes on a lot, folks, and you know it. And, and so what do we have? We have a lot of churches that, that have people sitting in the pews when they come to church, and they're unregenerate. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord because they've never truly repented of their sin and believed on Christ. They've never been regenerated. They don't have, this, they don't have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. So they don't have any interest in spiritual things. In fact, they have interest in sin. And, and, and maybe they try to hide their sin and maybe they don't. You know, not everybody who's, who's lost and yet professing Christ is, is out there saying, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm a homosexual or, you know, I, I, I do this stuff that everybody thinks is wrong, but it doesn't really matter. No, most people, I, I think it's most people that profess to know the Lord and, and don't pass this moral test, they, they try to keep it hidden. They don't want other people to know. They don't want other people to know about their sin. And again, we got to make sure we understand here. We're not talking about somebody who struggles with sin. Here, here's somebody who says, you know, I, I have homosexual tendencies. I'm attracted. A man says, I'm attracted to other men. But, but I, I know it's wrong, and I, I, want, I want help. Of course, it's against the law to try to help some <laughs> in some states try to help somebody like that, you get arrested. It's ridiculous, the, the laws of our land. But, but, you know, that person, you know, he, he, he needs help. He, he, he needs somebody to come alongside and, 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 and help him and pray with him and teach him. And he needs, you know, needs to be to help. But, but to just love sin and hold on to sin and not let it go is to not understand why christ came in the first place it's to not understand how we should live in light of his second coming and really it just comes down to this personally do you pass the moral test what about you it's easy to look at your brother or sister you know but what about you do you pass the moral test do you do you practice righteousness we're not looking for sinless perfection right no one's, gonna, no one's going to arrive there. But the question is really, is, is that the desire of your life? Do, do you want to live a righteous life? Do you, do you want to become more like Christ? Is that your desire? Is that, is that, is that your goal? Or do you really just practice sin? Do you just live in a way that's defiant in violating God's moral law. Listen to what John said in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, He came to take away sin and destroy the works of the devil who has been a sinner since the beginning. In a few minutes here, we're going to Remember the great price that Jesus paid to accomplish this work of taking away sin and destroying the works of the devil. He gave His perfect, sinless life. He shed His pure, undefiled blood to take away our sins and to loose us from the bonds of Satan in which we were bound. And so I would just ask all of us as be, before we partake of the Lord's table, if you're here this morning, you don't have to be a member of our church to partake of the Lord's table. We practice open communion. If you know the Lord is your Savior um, and you are in a right relationship with Him and you're in a right relationship with God's people, then, then we invite you to come and partake of the Lord's table. But, but you know, let me just take the opportunity to to ask, you know, is, is there sin in your life this morning that you need to repent of? 
that you need to forsake, that you need to confess. We, we looked at 1 John 1, 9 some weeks ago. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Th this will help you. This will help you in your daily life to remember what John is saying here. That sin is incompatible with Jesus first appearing. And it will bring shame for you at His second coming. So may, may we forsake our sin this morning as we come to the Lord's table and partake of these elements in remembrance of this great sacrifice that Christ has made for us. He came to put away sins, to take away sins, and to destroy the works of the devil. What fellowship has light with darkness? Let's, let's purify ourselves as we saw last week in this passage. Let's purify ourselves. Let's, let's, let's seek to, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit of God to work in us, to, to make us more like Jesus Christ and thereby bring glory to our Father. Lord, we thank you for this passage such a straightforward passage, Lord, that there are your children who practice righteousness and there are the children of the devil who practice lawlessness. Father, we pray for anyone here this morning who has never received Christ as Savior, never been born again. Lord, we pray that you would grant unto them repentance and faith that they might believe and be saved come to Christ and, and become one of your children. And Lord, we pray for all of us as, who are believers here today that you would help us, Lord, to realize the seriousness of sin and that it is incompatible with a Christian life because of who you are and what you have done to deliver us from sin. And Lord, help us to understand that being born of you and having the indwelling Spirit of God, that it is impossible to practice sin, to live a life of habitual sin. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who would have to admit that they are living a life of habitual sin, may you prick their hearts, may they turn from that sin and turn to Christ and, and truly be converted that they might enter into your family as one of your children be able to enjoy the benefits of being a child of God and the eternal life that you give in Christ Lord bless as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table and partake together may you minister to each of us here and may we worship you from our hearts in truth in jesus name amen